And what I like to do is while you're on hold, I like to check and make sure that it's going on my Facebook. And then we have audio. Oh, there it goes. All right. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to MattNews.biz, the podcast where I share my thoughts, opinions, and beliefs that have been lovingly dubbed Matt News. This episode is brought to you unofficially by Restream. Restream is the best way to live stream to YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and 30-plus streaming sites all at once. You can expand your audience with multi-streaming today at Restream.io. Please feel free to interact with me and my guests during tonight's live stream. Whether you're watching from Facebook, YouTube, or even Twitch, you can comment in the chat section, and we will see it and reserve a time at the end where we can respond to you. Now, tonight, we're talking, or we're tonight, we're going to dive deep in prayer. Tonight, we're talking about the Psalms, more specifically, the Psalms that ask God to rain down judgment upon enemies. My guest for this evening is Chaplain Kevin Benton Jr. of Greater Works uh, Discipleship Ministry. How are you doing, Chaplain? Hey, what's going on, everybody? How you doing, man? It's good to uh, see you and be with you. Thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So uh, before we get started rolling, I want to uh, share how I even uh, came to to find you on the yeah, internet. Yeah, I'm going to ask you about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it was funny because um, my wife was already friends with you on Facebook, and okay. she, you know, she, she friend requests a lot, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, it's usually like if they're Christian or they have something in common and all that, she just friend requests. Um, but we were looking for, because uh, she was wanting to do like a game night or something between me and her. And so I was like, well, let's do some Bible trivia, you know. And so we just uh, went on YouTube, looked up Bible trivia, Bible Jeopardy, and your video popped up. Yeah, the one okay. you did like a couple of, I think it was maybe a month ago. Yeah, when Damon you, was killing everybody. Yeah, man. Yeah. And you were asking questions. I was like, dang, I don't even know that one. <laughs> I've been a Christian for 20 years. I don't know that one. <laughs> so that's how I that's how I came across you. Um, but I, I did want to ask you a little bit if you could introduce kind of what your ministry is. It's a Greater Works Discipleship Ministry. Go ahead and explain that a little bit. Yeah, so Greater Works Discipleship Ministries is uh, my preaching and teaching ministry. Um, it has two facets. One is uh, my preaching ministry for when I'm preaching, whether it, it is as, as a active duty military uh, army chaplain um, or whether it is just in the pulpits and local churches that I've been serving a part of. So wherever the Lord allows me the opportunity and privilege of uh, delivering the gospel uh, to his people, um, I love to get that uh, the, the gospel message out there across the different platforms that social media and technology allows us uh, to do. Uh, but most, I ain't gonna say most importantly, but the other side of that is the uh, Discipleship Academy. And that is where I do a lot of actual teaching. Um, so the, the military and God, uh, by utilizing the military has allowed me the opportunity to get my education. I got my Master of Divinity um, from Liberty University in 2015. Uh, and um, I, I, I did not, I would not have been able to pay for seminary out of my own pocket. Um, so the Lord really blessed and the, the military paid for that. And so it gave me the option um, or the opportunity to get that education. So the Discipleship Academy, Greater Works Discipleship Academy is where I actually teach seminary level courses. And that is my opportunity to sow into other people seminary level information um, at a fraction of the cost. And so it was birthed out um, while I was here in Washington um, a couple of years back. And I started doing classes um, online and in person. So I did them in person, but broadcast them online and was uh, paying attention to both audiences. I had people writing papers, taking tests and different things. But the object and the goal, of course, was to uh, help them become complete and competent um, disciples of Jesus Christ. Um, from my understanding of the biblical doctrine of discipleship, um, I, I love the definition that Paul uses or the explanation that Paul does in 2 Timothy 2 and 2 when he says the things that you have seen and heard of me, um, he says uh, in, in our time together, he says, take them and commit them or teach them to faithful men who will teach mm -hmm. others also. So Paul teaches Timothy, Timothy teaches faithful men and faithful men teach other people as well. 
And so mm -hmm. my goal is to teach other people, but to do so in a way that those other people can turn around and teach someone else. So if I teach them, but they can't turn around and regurgitate that information, then we haven't really done discipleship in the way that the way uh, that the Bible intends for it to be done. Um, so that's my goal. And that's what Greater Works is all about. Um, if you're interested in learning more about that or to get more information, you can visit my website. It's uh, www.greaterworksdiscipleship.com. Again, www www.greaterworksdiscipleship.com. I have a lot of my preaching videos and teaching videos on there, as well as uh, I develop PowerPoints that are editable um, that can be shared um, with different people so that they can turn around and teach the same classes that I've taught, the same information that I've taught. They could take it, put their name on it, put your church's name on it, and utilize it to teach small groups, Bible studies. And we've done everything on there, Matt, from uh, soteriology to slavery in the Bible, um, how to study the Bible, um, just anything in subject that comes up of importance. I like to develop a, um, a, a series of teaching on it right now. I'm doing Jesus versus uh, other gods, examining all the different worldviews of the Bible. So we started with atheism and now we're on scientism slash evolution. And so we put all of those things on there so that people can then take that information and then turn around and teach it to other people as well. So. Yeah. Um, so my wife just commented, she, uh, she, put your website address in there so you can click on that um, if you're in the comment section on Facebook. But I'm also going to leave the um, a link in the description as well so people okay. can get connected with you and everything like that, man. Because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of Christians out there who want to dig deeper, but they just don't know where to go. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, so they can't afford seminary, you know. Yeah. And um, non-Christians as well. You know, I think this has been uh, this Jesus versus secular gods, which uh, derived from a book with, from a Ravi Zacharias called Jesus versus other gods. Um, mm -hmm. And, it, you know, most of the people today, matter of fact, uh, praise be to God, I had uh, the biggest attendance in my um, Bible study at my unit has 16 people in there for a Bible study that's really only four or five weeks old. And so we're growing. And I would say that 90% of the people in there are unbelievers or very, very babes in Christ. Um, mm. And so learning about these other worldviews and what Christianity teaches, man, you talk about motivational, uh, you know, seeing them learn and grow has been uh, some of the greatest fulfillment of my life uh, because my primary audience for the majority of my life has been teaching in church to people who primarily know some of the gospel, um, but mm. having to present it and, and having the opportunity pre to present it to people who are not as familiar with Christian doctrine. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's incredible. I, I just love it. You know, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. There's, um, I don't know if you're familiar with TikTok or if you're on TikTok. Oh yeah. Oh, yes. uh, love oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to connect with you on TikTok too. Yeah. Um, but there's a girl on there right now and she's like, she's in her thirties and she, uh, uh, no religious background whatsoever. Um, just wanted to know what the Bible says. So she bought a Bible and started reading it, um, oh. from a liter from a literary standpoint is what right. she said. But I was like, Hey, I think that's the best way to go about it yeah. is you, you read this Bible, like a story, you're going to get so much more out of it than a lot of other people are going to get out gotcha. of it. Gotcha. Um, so, the, uh, we, we tried to come up with a subject to talk about. And uh, I, like I was telling you before the show, before we started, was that, uh, you know, we're we're steeped in kind of this election season. Oh, yeah. And um, there was so the, so the president got COVID. Mm -hmm. And on my side, um, on, on what I was seeing a lot of was people saying, hey, uh, we need to pray for the president and things like that. Um, but you're saying on your side, you actually saw a lot of people heaping down judgment upon him, as well, you know, um, and then. So we kind of landed on what our topic should be is the imprecatory Psalms and how we as Christians should deal with those. So uh, what are imprecatory Psalms? Sit. Good. So, uh, yeah. So uh, as a military chaplain, and I'm just going to put it out there because I like to be very open and honest, uh, but not enough where I'm going to get kicked out the military for it. Either. <laughs> but, you know, so, right. Uh, but you know, as a military member, we are forbidden of saying anything negative or critiquing, I believe is the right word, critiquing any uh, elected official. So not just the president, but any um, elected official. So I, I wanted to stay away from uh, anything that would appear or even give the uh, implication that uh, uh, that. I would be critiquing any particular official. But as you said, your timeline was one way in mine. Uh, I have a predominantly um, African-American audience. Um, of mm -hmm. course, I'm connected with people of all faiths and different colors and different things, but predominantly African-American and uh, predominantly Democratic uh, and, and just not really um, in favor of President Trump's uh, policies and different things. And so I have seen other people um, uh, you know, kind of heaping down uh, or wanting judgment to come down upon him for their perceived um, um, uh, 
perception of his, you know, the, his policies, his personality, um, mm -hmm. and different things like that. And so a lot of people were using the imprecatory Psalms to, uh, as justification for their, uh, you know, for their, uh, for their, for not perception, what's the word? I'm gonna get all tongue tied, um, for their views in the way that they were approaching things. So the imprecatory Psalms are Psalms of judgment. Um, they were written primarily by David in the Psalms, of course, uh, and where he would speak very, um, harshly some would say um in reference to wanting you know uh negative things to happen to people who were oppressing him um for example as a tour i don't want to get too far ahead of you uh, on their map yeah, go ahead. but yeah so for example I, I i wrote some of them down um psalms 5 7 17 28 35 40 55 59 70 71 79 80 94 129 137 139 and 140 all of them have um verses in there that if you read it at the beginning, it's like, man, you know, David's going in on these jokers. So for instance, Psalms 40 and 14 says, let those be ashamed and humiliated together who seek my life to destroy it. Let those be turned back and dishonored who delight in my hurt. That's kind of an elementary imprecatory psalm. And then you go to Psalms 58 and 6, which says, oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. Um, mm -hmm. you know, or uh, Psalm 71 and 13, let those who are adversaries of my soul be ashamed and consumed. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor who seek to injure me. So there are uh, Psalms 137 and 9, which is probably one of the um, harsher in language ones that says, uh, how blessed will be the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. And mm -hmm. so when you read stuff like this, it's like, wow, you know, looking at the language at face value, it's like, man, David or, you know, the writer of this Psalm is really uh, wanting harsh levels, what we would consider harsh levels of judgment uh, levied against his enemies and not just his enemies, which I think is an important point, but the enemies of God. Um, so those are what the imprecatory Psalms are. And they're not just in the Old Testament. And I'm sure we'll get into that. There are some um, that are not imprecatory Psalms, but imprecatory verses um, in the New Testament as well. But that's uh, really what um, what the imprecatory Psalms are. They're basically Psalms or requests um, for God to execute judgment um, upon his enemies or the enemies of his people. So how in, in light of all these, because I'm kind of going through um, I'm kind of going through a phase where. Uh, I take statements like, you know, um, sermons on the sermon on the Mount, mm -hmm. you know, and you see Jesus talk about, you know, pray for your enemies, yes. you know, the meek will inherit the earth, yeah. uh, things like that. And, and, and it kind of sways you more toward, um, or at least in my studies, it sways me more right. toward uh, pacifism, you know, and, and even again, praying for my enemies. I want to pray goodwill upon those who I might not agree with. Um, so how do we as Christians reconcile that? That's a really good question. I think that's basically what the whole conversation is about. Um, mm -hmm. And first, there's a couple of um, um, there's a couple of things. And so, number one, if I had to really put a title on this um, and everything like that, I would really talk about how the glory of God, how how God is still brought glory, not just through mercy, but also through justice. Uh, one of the central themes of the Bible is God receiving glory in salvation through judgment based upon his enemies. If you look in throughout the book of Revelation um, and different things like that, we see that that is God's the, the time period and God will execute judgment or execute his wrath against the world because of sin. And I think sometimes we get desensitized to um, to God's holiness and to uh, and that sin has to be punished. Um, and, and so we when we see things like this and when we see it in harsh language, uh, what, what seems to us to be harsh language, it's it seems difficult for us to reconcile because we're used to seeing God receiving glory through mercy, through God receiving glory through grace, because we are recipients of grace. But there are some out there who just have willed in their hearts that they will that they are going to operate in perpetual treason and rebellion against God and not only against God but against his people and so for people like that who uh, are, know the truth but suppress the truth in unrighteousness as Romans 1 would say the imprecatory psalms are asking for God to do exactly what he said he would do which is to execute judgment against the wrongdoers um, so one of the things I looked up was, uh, you know, Genesis 12. When we look at Genesis 12 and 3, um, uh, God says in there to Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant, he says, and I will bless those who bless you and I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. 
So even then, as early back in Genesis, along with uh, in, in Abraham, he's telling Abraham, look, anybody that blesses you because you are my delegated representative in the earth and through you, all nations, all people will be blessed. If someone blesses you, that's the same as blessing me. If someone curses or speaks against you, then that's the same thing in God's eyes as speaking or, or speaking against me. And so they, uh, God promised them, if anyone speaks against you or operates in any level of contempt against you, then they're going to receive a curse from me. So the imprecatory Psalms would be just one of those ways where God is yet glorified in executing judgment against people who have willfully willed in their hearts to rebel against him and operate in treason against him and against those who are his delegated responsive uh, people in the earth. So I think in in, in terms of uh, in this particular season and time period in the earth, particularly with everything that's going on with the Black Lives Matter movement and social mm -hmm. justice and different things that are really hot topics, we see we, we must recognize and acknowledge that God is not just brought glory through grace and through mercy, which are things he does not have to give us. If he gave us anything that we deserve, it would be justice. And so understanding that all of us are deserving of the judgment of God, but in his, in his grace and mercy, he extends that to us, but he does not have to. And so if God chooses in his sovereignty and in his infinite wisdom to pour out judgment against someone, then that is his divine prerogative. And us praying that God would execute judgment against his enemies is not something that is wrong, but it is something that if we're going to do that, I would say that we need to check the status of our hearts and make sure that we're not trying to do it in um, in sinful response to our emotions or or and in making it personal, but it ought to be prophetic. And that's one of the things, if we look at David, we look at uh, Paul, when we look at even Jesus who spoke in imprecatory language, it was always in judgment against God's enemies in a prophetic manner, but not in a personal manner. Whenever we try to use the scriptures to speak uh, personally against God and acting as if God is our attack dog, then we're operating in, in a spirit that does not line up with the, the spirit of the imprecatory Psalms, nor the spirit of God in, in and of itself. So I hope that kind of um, is a long-winded way of answering your question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, a little bit. Um... A little bit, because I mean, like you were saying, I guess how we reconcile that is because you have to recognize that um, uh, with the mercy and with uh, the flower, flower, flowery, flowery language that yeah. you know Jesus sometimes uses. There's also just you know Matthew, you know the the, the Olivet discourse. You know this not one turn, not one stone will stand on another. You know judgment. You know yeah. all the judgment calls there. Um, so there is that justice and that judgment that's going to come, and we have to recognize that yeah. um, as well. But one of the things that you just said that that's interesting to me is um, bringing in that personal uh, experience, you know, that personal um, aspect of it as well. Um, and I, I guess that's kind of the conversation we want to have right yeah. now is people have people using the imprecatory Psalms in a personal manner rather than doing that gut check and that heart check. Oh, yeah. So how, so, so, so um, I guess as a question, how can we make sure that what we're doing is, is properly using the imprecatory Psalms? Um, one, uh, I think it's being sensitive to the Holy spirit and also mm -hmm. looking at scripture in context. Um, so one of the things that we will see in, in the imprecatory Psalms and that most of them, and I, I'll give you an example, um, is that when we see the imprecatory Psalms um, several times, they are, they are spoken of after people, after David has prayed or done well to his enemies. You know, of course, because of, uh, as you said, uh, the scripture, um, Luke 6, 27 through 29, when it talks about praying for your enemies and loving your enemies and doing good to them who despitefully use you and persecute you, et cetera, et cetera. There were several times when David, David had done what good to his enemies and, and, and done well against them. And yet, and still they treated him with contempt. So uh, for instance, there is um, uh, Psalms 35, 12 through 13, where he says, they requit me evil for good. When they were sick, I wore sackcloth. So David was like, hey, when they were sick, I was out there wearing sackcloth. I was mourning. I was praying for them that they would be restored, that they would be made whole. Yet when the situation was reversed, they didn't, they, you know, they they did me evil in return for my good. Um, Psalms 109, four through five, he says, in return for my love, they accuse me even as I make prayer for them. So they reward me evil for good and hatred for my love. So here it is, David, a man after God's own heart, 
He is loving on people. He's praying for people. You know, he's interceding on their behalf. And instead of, uh, you know, giving him, you know, do, doing the same for him, they do the exact opposite of that. And so when David is like, hey, you know, I keep knocking at the door and keep, you know, interceding on your behalf and doing good to you. Yet when it's time for you to return the favor, you want to do evil against me. Well, again, God, you know, God is not going to be mocked. He's not going to continue to let anyone uh, continuously um, do, you know, execute evil against someone that is doing good against them. So David was absolutely well within his rights because we we, we want to make sure that we contextualize the imprecatory Psalms and understanding that it, it goes against the very character of God, who is love, um, who not just does love, but he is love to think that he would just execute judgment or be okay with someone just, hey, someone talked about me and did me wrong one time and thinking that, oh, we're just going to wipe them off the, you know, the face of the earth and dash their babies against the rocks. No, these were meant and spoken against people who repeatedly and intentionally continue to execute evil against God's representative. And if we know anything about David, David was a man who had a great level of resilience. He had a great level of self-control. This is the same man who uh, was better than me, Matthew. I'm just be straight, Matt. You know, yeah. sitting in, in uh, Saul's court and Saul's throwing javelins at him and he comes back. You got, uh, just be straight, man. You got one time to throw a javelin at me. And we were talking about <laughs> Kevin Benton, who's a chaplain, who's now a non-combatant throwing a javelin. Saul was not no punk. You know, Saul was a great warrior. You know, we, yeah, Saul had, I mean, David had slain his 10,000s, but killing thousands still ain't something to sleep on. So when Saul throws a javelin, that thing is meant with some purpose behind it. So here is a man who, who loved Saul enough that he would not touch God's anointed when he had every opportunity to do so, when he had every justification for doing so, yet he operated with restraint and with love and interceded on behalf of Saul. So if he would do that for someone like Saul, we're understanding that David is not the type of person that would just go out there and just want evil for someone just because they're not an Israelite or just because they did him wrong, you know, one time. That doesn't, that does not reflect the character of God and it would not reflect the character of his representative and his king at that time and David as well. So what do you think the disconnect is for us, you know, especially Christian Americans? Um, where, where do you think that disconnect happens where we um, are a, are able to almost say, you know, well, hey, um, well, they're not a King Saul, you know, uh, you know, they're not God's anointed, you know, to be king of Israel or anything like that. You know, they're elected by us. Where do you think that disconnect happens? I think some of it is in whose glory are we really seeking? I honestly believe with all of my heart that when David was praying, this is a man that's after God's own heart. He's pursuing God's heart. So when he prays for God to execute judgment against his enemies, he's doing so for the glory of God, not the glory of Israel, not the glory of David or the Davidic kingdom or that God would enhance his house. David was concerned primarily, first, foremost, and maybe even only for the glory of God to be manifested and for the kingdom of God to be spread throughout all the earth. Because, again, that's what Genesis 12 was all about, is all the nations of the world being blessed through uh, through Abraham. And of course, uh, uh, David was part of that lineage coming down from, from Abraham uh, through, of course, the, uh, the tribe of Judah and everything like that. So uh, the disconnect, I believe, for some people is whose glory are we seeking? Do you want people who are your enemies now? Do you want God to execute judgment against them in this life um, because it will bring him glory? Or do you want that because it will bring you glory and eliminate something that you don't want to pray about? or eliminate something that you don't want to operate in self-control about, or you we lack the spirit uh, of, of long suffering. And so because I don't want to go through this, because I don't want to exercise patience or let patience have its perfect work um, in different things, I'll ask God to get rid of the problem because I'm, I have a thorn in my flesh you know, I don't want to, but God's grace to be sufficient to sustain me in that season. I want to get rid of it. And so I'll pray and ask God to execute judgment. So who's being, if God was to grant the prayer of our heart, who would be glorified? Um, so, I, uh, of course, obvious examples. If we're praying for Hitler to be removed out of power, Saddam Hussein, uh, the Taliban, um, you know, any uh, person who is uh, because of their religious beliefs is, uh, you know, doing suicide bombing. In those things, because of the number of people that are being harmed, because the kingdom of God, it, it may be um, uh, preventing the expansion of the kingdom of God into people who are sincerely seeking in their faith. When those things are in place, 
um, and people, you know, are praying, hey, God, we want you to execute judgment against these people because they're killing innocent lives because they are, you know, uh, you know, preventing the spread of the gospel and, and, you know, and different things. Then God is glorified in that. But it becomes personal when it's just, you know, I don't like this person and they did me wrong and they've been talking about me and, they, you know, yada, yada, yada. And then you want you're praying an imprecatory psalm. Uh, because of something personal, but you're not really concerned about God's glory. You're concerned about uh, your own. And so I mm -hmm. think that's where some of the disconnect in. And I just don't think that we can see that in the life and character of a person like David, Saul, or of course, uh, Jesus himself. Right. And, but do you think that some people, cause I know you, it's, it's hard to frame these questions, you know, cause I don't no, want to have you, <laughs> uh, but, but so, so we were talking specifically about how people were praying these precatory Psalms over Trump. Um, and I am in the firm belief that if the shoe was on the other foot and we let's say we had Hillary, you know, in office right now, I think that Republicans would be praying the imprecatory Psalms as well. Yeah. Um, but so but but some of them would say like the people who are praying against Trump would say, well, I think it would definitely glorify God if he got out of office, you know, and then we were able, we were able to enact some of these policies that are a little bit more liberal, a little bit more democratic. You know, yeah. um, they would say that that would glorify God. Do you think that there's a disconnect with with them as well, even on the other side, even if it again, if it was Republicans praying against Joe Biden, which I know that they are probably would, you know, um, would would if they saw themselves as saying, I think it would, would give glory to God because I view this person as an evil person, right. you know, yeah. um, do you think that they are, aren't just, aren't looking well enough? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I, I believe so. And that some people's allegiance not is, is not to the theocratic kingdom of God, but to the democratic or Republican, you know, mm -hmm. worldview that a person expo espouses. And so whether it is a, uh, whether it is, uh, Republicans praying that, you know, Biden doesn't get elected because they believe that God would be glorified most through uh, President Trump, you know, or, you know, Democrats, you know, through Biden or, or different things like that. Understanding that God's glory is not dependent upon a particular person. It's not dependent upon a political party. God was glorified while King Herod was in power. God was glorified through Pharaoh um, and, and different things. And so God, God can be glorified however he sees fit. And so it, it, a mature Christian is, is, is praying, God, not what do I want and not what do I think is best, but what do you think is best? You know, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so it's, it's really humbling ourselves to say, okay, God, can you be glorified more through someone who maybe is not the, the, the candidate I want in office, but yet instill your glory being manifested through it? A perfect example. Um, what's my brother's name? Uh, Nebuchadnezzar. God was glorified through Nebuchadnezzar being on the throne and um, and the Hebrew boys, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah going in there and being manifested and God preserving them in the midst of, you know, uh, the, the commandment to bow down. Um, that was one example uh, with them um, through King Cyrus. God was manifested uh, when the children of Israel, when he issued the edict to be able to allow the uh, the children of Israel to go back and begin to rebuild the uh, the temple and different things. God can work even through pagan unbelieving kings. When Paul had to go through Agrippa, um, he was God was glorified. But Paul was uh, God was glorified with Paul being in prison, writing letters and and writing half of the uh, you know portions of the New Testament while he was in prison. God does not have to have have optimal circumstances, optimal people, the best people in office, or that we think in order for him to be glorified. Sometimes he desires to be glorified, even in the midst of what we would consider um, adverse circumstances. And so it's just, I, I think, really being in tune with the spirit and saying, okay, God, you know, um, I, I'm going to pray, but ultimately, you know, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. But I think that there are certainly cases where we can all agree that there are certain people, your Saddam's, your Osama bin Laden's, you know, you know, your people like that, where the world can come together and say, hey, these people, God, we're asking you to execute judgment upon them because of their will for rebellion against your your will and your uh, and your way. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess that kind of leads me into this next set of questions. Well, I don't have any set of questions, but just my, my, my mindset now is um, so when when do you think it's OK for Christians to pray? Um, imprecatory, imprecatory psalms, and I know you mentioned that there are some imprecatory verses in the New Testament. Um, what are some of those as well? 
Good, good stuff, man. Okay, so uh, imprecatory psalms also are the songs of the oppressed. These are not people who were in power. These were not the mighty. These were the oppressed people that were praying these psalms, and they were praying from a position of vulnerability and weakness, not dominance and triumphalism. All right. So when when David and, and, and these, these people are saying, hey, God, we are being oppressed. These are nations that are coming up against us. We, we're asking for you to vindicate us. We're not asking for you, you to uh, show us how powerful we are, but we're asking for you to show how powerful you are. And so imprecatory psalms are the psalms of the oppressed. So can we really say that we are uh, the uh, oppressed people? If you know that you're, you know, with all the laws and, and different things, and yes, I, I you know, I want to make sure I'm very careful in that. You can mm -hmm. still be oppressed, and and you know, as a, 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 a you and, and feel like it, it, there are people of color that feel like we're oppressed in this world. But we have the Constitution and different laws out there that were just not in place for some of these people who were oppressed. Our, our oppression, I don't think, in any way compares to the oppression of some of the people in in the scriptures. And so looking at that, you know, people who are martyred um, for their faith and different things like that. I was listening to the story of Polycarp uh, today in my devotion, who was burned alive because he refused to acknowledge, uh, you know, the emperor at that particular time. So understanding that these are songs that come from people that were in positions of vulnerability um, and in weakness um, uh, as well. So some of the, uh, let's look at some of the New Testament examples of the imprecatory songs. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16 and 22, which says, if anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be upon him, O Lord, come. So here mm -hmm. is Paul, an apostle of God, who's praying what would be considered an imprecatory uh, prayer. Um, also in Galatians, uh, Galatians, the first chapter, the eighth through the ninth verse. This is a really good one. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, than which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if any man preach a gospel unto you other than that we have received, let him be accursed. So that's another example. Um, in Timothy, we have 2 Timothy 4 and 14, uh, when Paul was talking about Alexander the coppersmith, he says, Alexander the coppersmith has done me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. And then uh, an example from Revelation 6 and 10, uh, last one, and then I got one also on there for Jesus. But these are the uh, the cry of the martyrs, the people who were cru uh, not crucified, but killed for their faith. And it says, and when he, uh, again, Revelation 6 and 10, and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice. Here it is. How long, O Lord, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So understanding that there are times, even then, as you can see, the martyr's blood was crying out for God to execute justice, not vengeance, not just vengeance, but justice against people who had wrongly killed them and martyred them for their faith. So here's a couple of theological principles, man, I want to share with everybody um, when it comes to the imprecatory psalms. Number one is that scripture repeatedly and intentionally tells us that uh, vengeance belongs to God. That's Psalm, uh, Deuteronomy 32, 35, Psalms 94 and 1. Um, this excludes personal retaliation and necessitates the appeal to God to punish the wicked. So we're not praying for us to be able to do it, but we're praying for God to execute his divine judgment on them, understanding that God will only do so when we pray in accordance with his will, not in accordance with our own personal uh, personal convictions, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Um, number two, that God uh, God's righteousness demands judgment on the wicked. In order for God to be righteous, in order for him to be just, he has to execute judgment on the wicked. We can see that in Psalms 5 and 6 and then in Psalms uh, the 11th chapter, verses 5 through 6. Uh, number three, that God's covenant love for the people of God necessitates intervention on their part. Um, Psalms 5 through uh, 5 and 7, uh, 59 and 10, and verses 16 and 17, where understanding that if these are God's covenant people, if uh, understanding, hey, look, if these are God's people, then it is God's responsibility to protect them, to cover them, to watch over them, to provide for them. And if enemies are attacking God's people, it's within his character. It's totally within his his, uh, you know, his honor to protect those that carry his name in the same way that anybody that carries the name Benton, you come against one of us, 
you coming against all of us, you know, mm -hmm. in, in that same token. Um, and number four, prayer that believers trust God with all their thoughts and desires. In praying the imprecatory Psalms, we're saying that, hey, God, we trust you to execute judgment in your sovereign will and at your sovereign time. This may not be the time to execute judgment against these people, but we're praying and saying, hey, God, we're praying this, but we understanding that it's going to happen according to your timeline and when you and when and how you desire for it to be so, not in a way that we desire for it to be so. Um, and then we already talked about um, resisted love, understanding that the imprecatory Psalms came after plea after plea for David praying for people and mourning for people who did not do uh, them. Uh, last two examples are the examples that we get from Jesus and from Paul. So let's, let's examine Jesus in Psalms uh, in, um, in John 15 and 25. And I want to uh, read that real quick. Let me pull up. Yeah. My... Hold on. I can actually pull it up and put it Perfect. on the screen real quick. Oh, yeah. What version do you use? Uh, CSB is normally the version I, I prefer. Uh, we can get into that why a little later if, if necessary. <laughs> I mean, the bottom line is that the uh, dynamic and formal equivalence is the best version um, out right now in terms of readability, but also in terms of word for word rendering of scripture. So it's close to word for word, and but also in a readable manner as well. So, but if you got HCSB, I mean, we can go King James version. It, it'll, it'll still, you know, the concept will still be there. Right. Yeah. I, I've got a, a buddy who um, reads mostly from the King James, mm -hmm. um, only because he he says it, uh, um, because that's what most the, of the people he kind of uh, yeah. teaches read, you know, and so they take it as kind of a authority, more authoritative. All right. So here we go. Here's the. Uh, actually, I'll just. Uh, maximize it and minimize us there we go okay and so this is csb right okay here. um that's john uh it's hard to see yes it is john chapter 15 uh verse 25 okay so uh it says but this happened so that the statement written in their law might be fulfilled they hated me for no reason all right that particular verse uh refers back to one of the imprecatory Psalms in Psalm 69 and four. Um, so Psalm 69 and four is basically gonna say that same thing. Man, it's a lot of these Psalms trying to... Yeah, those who hate me without cause are more numerous than the hairs of my head. My deceitful enemies who would destroy me are powerful. Though I did not steal, I must repay. So you can see here that Jesus in uh, in John 15 and 25 is referring back to one of the imprecatory uh, Psalms in Psalms uh, 35. And he also does this again uh, in Psalms 109, uh, four through five, if you can uh, pull that up as well. And that'll be the uh, the last one for uh, uh, for Jesus. OK, 109, four through five. Yep. Yeah, there you go. And then you can see it there. It says, um, in return for my love, they accuse me, but I continue to pray. They repay me evil for good and hatred for my love. So you can see when Jesus is talking in John, in the book of John, he's referring back to these two imprecatory Psalms, but he's doing so and praying in that same particular manner. All right. So the, so we see that even Jesus was not, I want to say immune, uh, but this was not something that he avoided doing, but that he prayed in accordance with the imprecatory Psalms as well. And then there are examples. Um, uh, oh, there is one more. There's uh, Matthew 27 and 24. We can examine that real quick. Uh, I got a little bit of time. Matthew 20. Matthew 27, you said verse 4? 24. Oh, 24. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that a riot was starting instead, he took some water, washed his hands in front of the crowd and said, I am menacing that this man's blood see to it yourselves. And all the people answered his blood be on us and all our children. Um, that refers back to uh, Psalm 69 and 21. Psalm 69. Psalm 69 and 21 says, instead, they gave me gall for my food and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar, vinegar to drink. 
Um, and then um, down in verse uh, 24, it says, pour out your rage on them and let your burning anger overtake them. And so remember when they, you know, when Jesus was hanging on the cross and everything like that, uh, you know, it just, it, it, it shows that even Jesus was not exempt from praying in accordance with some Psalms that some people might have considered, uh, you know, uh, something that wasn't the nicest sounding stuff, um, in, you know, in the world. And then lastly, the example, we don't have to, uh, it's just one particular verse where Paul in Romans uh, 11, uh, well, matter of fact, we, we could pull it up, man. Let's go ahead and do that. Romans, yeah. Romans 11 verses nine through 10. All right, good stuff. And then he says, and David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a pitfall and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and their backs be bent continually. This refers back to the Psalm, which basically almost quotes it word for word from Psalm 69 uh, and 69 and 22 through 23. Yep, there it is. Let their eyes grow too dim to see and let their hips continually quake. Pour out your rage on them and let your burning anger overtake them. And so you can see here, even um, uh, Paul referenced back into some of the imprecatory Psalms. So these were not things that the people of the New Testament, including Jesus himself, shied away from. They were things that they embraced in con in context, understanding that, you know, these were um you know, praying it in context, not just wanting to do something out of a personal vendetta against someone, but in a under a prophetic um, in a prophetic manner, asking God to execute judgment um, upon his enemies. And I just want to read this quote uh, from um, from John Piper. Um, he says, "We will grant to the psalmist, usually David, who speaks under the guidance of the Holy Spirit as foreshadowed Messiah and Judge, the right to call down judgment on the enemies of God." This is not personal vindictiveness. It is a prophetic execution of what will happen at the last day when God casts all his enemies into the lake of fire. So I just want to um, kind of close out that thought by, you know, understanding that um, a lot of times uh, one of my prayers when I struggle with a particular sin is God help me to see this in the way that you see this. And mm -hmm. a lot of times I think we can become desensitized to how God sees sin, not just against him, but against his people. And so it may seem very harsh for us to look at, you know, praying for someone to be killed or praying for them to be mutilated, but God is looking at the, the treason, the rebellion, the offense against his holy nature and his character that someone would come against God and his people when they are executing his divine plan. And so we, 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 I think we can sometimes get, because we're so used to grace and mercy and the, the fluffiness, I think, you know, you mm -hmm. call it and everything that we forget that sin stinks in God's nostrils. It's not something that he ever wanted to tolerate so much to the point where, you know, God could not even look upon his own son on the cross when he bore the sins of the world. So sin is not something that God has ever had a passive nature about. It only appears that way because now when God looks upon sin, he sees it through Jesus Christ who has already suffered the penalty um, for our sin. Um, but, you know, sin requires judgment. It requires, uh, you know, justice um, against it. And so it should not be something that we, um, uh, 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 it brings us sorrow when, you know, God executes judgment against people. Understanding God is not doing this just off a whim. If God decides to execute his divine judgment, anything he does is just and, and it is holy and he's doing so in his own sovereignty. So we know that it's going to be in accordance with his, his will and his character and his, uh, you know, and, and his abilities. So that that's kind of uh, the argument there. Yeah. Yeah. So where, I mean, where do you think, because we've talked about how people can use it just flippantly, you know, use these imprecatory yeah. Psalms for their own will. But what about somebody like, you know, like myself who, uh, you know, um, I would be very, uh, cautious to use an imprecatory psalm, or even to to pray or to pray imprecatorily toward anyone, because you know, because um, like you know, like I I understand that like Trump is just a man, mm -hmm. you know, and he he's a man who uh, uh, who God loves so much that he died on the cross, you know, to save him from his sins, and hopefully Trump 
has accepted him. We don't know. There's, <laughs> you know, we don't really yeah. know. Um, but we would hope that, you know, I would hope the same thing for, for Joe Biden and for any politician out there um, or anybody out there that I would say, you know, hey, I don't really see eye to eye with them. Um, but I don't know if I would personally feel comfortable with praying imprecatorily or anything like that. Do you think that that's a, a, a good thing or do you think that Christians, you know, uh, again, I know it comes back to the whole, you know, we want to make sure that what we're praying for is for God's will. But even so, it's it's hard for me um, to to cast judgment toward anyone. Yeah, um, uh, I I would. Uh, I've been to war, so I've seen. Um, mm -hmm. So I would have no problem like Psalms 58 and six, you know, oh, oh God, break the teeth in their mouths when I'm about to go up and fight against uh, Saddam Hussein and the, you know, the Iraqi army and different things, you know, so uh, or low. Excuse me, Psalms 94, one through two. Oh Lord, God of vengeance, God of vengeance, shine forth. You know, so if we're going to, uh, we want to preach the whole counsel of God, which includes the imprecatory Psalms. Um, so if we're going to say, you know, um, what's the Psalm that we, we sing all the time? Um, the battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. Then we got to let him fight that battle, you know, mm -hmm. and there is no war, there is no battle that's going to be fought. Uh, God ain't fighting fist fights, you know, this, this is, right. you know, Gonna re, you know, there's going to be some blood. There's going to be some, you know, some divine judgment that comes down, uh, you know, upon these people. So being a person who uh, now that there's a total difference in praying an imprecatory uh, prayer and saying, God, uh, you know, remove this person from power. Uh, you know, uh, you know, we, we need to go in there and kill Saddam and all those that stand against, um, you know, the principles of the kingdom of God and different things like that. That's completely different than saying, oh, God, uh, you know, seize their infants and dash them upon the rocks, you know. Right. That's completely different. So it's praying in context and understanding that uh, David's prayers were uh, prayed and inspired by the Holy Spirit. Ours are not, you know, in that particular sense, you know, ours are not sacred scripture in that we're praying in with that same level of inspiration would be a good word. Now we can use those um, in principle and praying for uh, kingdoms, praying. Um, so what is this? the scripture? Um, uh, Holy Spirit, help me with that one. Um, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness. So we're praying against spiritual wickedness. God, you know, God, we're praying that all forces and all kingdoms and all people of power who stand against your will, who stand against the progress of the advancement of the kingdom of God would be torn down, that their altars would be torn down, that their strong places uh, would be torn down, that the systems of their power would be torn down, that all racist uh, uh, propaganda, all racist powers, um, all racist systems, all forms of oppression uh, would be torn down, whether it be an unjust prison system or unjust sentencing, um, you know, all of these different forms, uh, unjust police practices that are systemic um, throughout, you know, society. There's nothing wrong with praying imprecatorily. That's praying imprecatorily, even mm. without praying um, in the harshness of praying that specific people would die. You know, there's a difference in, you know, and the Holy Spirit should absolutely guide our hearts in praying against a system or a, a praying. I have no problem praying for Saddam Hussein's death or Osama bin Laden's death. I was glad when them uh, Navy SEALs took him out, you know, and different things, you know, because these are people who have repeatedly and intentionally said, hey, I understand the truth of God's word, but I've willed in my heart that I'm going to, you know, uh, to do that. And understanding that even in that, God is glorified. In execution of his justice, God is glorified in executing judgment against evil. And then here's the thing, Matt, that uh, that brings me great comfort. I believe that the scripture teaches that there is not one person that wants to submit to the the that receives the pull of the uh, on their heart from the Holy Spirit that, you know, no man can come to the spirit, the father, lest the spirit draw him. That if that person wants to respond to the spirit of God, that God is going to execute his judgment upon that person prior to them having the opportunity to do so. I think scripture uh, repeatedly teaches against that and shows that that's not going to be possible. So anybody that God, again, in his sovereign time and in his sovereign way, decides that he's going to bring glory to himself by executing judgment against that person, that that's going to bring him just as much glory as executing or giving grace and mercy to another individual. Uh, God was glorified in taking out Pharaoh and in drowning the entire Egyptian army. He was glorified in doing that. 
Um, and so we, it would be, if that was the equivalent of Saddam Hussein in the Iraqi army that we defeated, or uh, if we had to, we almost went to war with North Korea uh, two years ago, and I was in the headquarters unit in uh, First Corps here at JBLM that would have directed those uh, those war efforts and, and, and different things. And so I absolutely would have been praying for the downfall of Kim Jong Young or however you pronounce his name, you know, and North Korea because of the unjust practices and the, you know, when you look at all of the, the death, the destruction, the persecution that is taking place in those cities, if we remove and pray for the death of the people in power, then it allows for the missionaries um, and different people who are trying to take the kingdom of God into places like China and in North Korea, but can't do so freely right now because of the people that are in power, um, you know, in those particular places. So, and I think uh, last thing, because I, I, I feel like I'm being long winded, but no, uh, that's the thing with David and his his prayers being guided by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is that David was coming of the, uh, the lineage that Jesus would flow through. And so anybody that was standing against David wasn't just standing against David, they're standing in the way of the progress of the King of Kings coming through his lineage. So anybody that was trying to kill David was killing what was in him. So anybody that was coming against him was coming against the lineage and the covenant promises of God that would flow through him. All of us can't say that. And so David's prayer was justified in a different manner than ours would be contextualized. It's justified in a different manner. You know, Jesus ain't coming through or he's already come and done his work. It's already been completed, but it had not done so at that particular time. And so I think we need to just frame it. How is the kingdom of God advanced? How is God glorified through this prayer that I'm preparing to pray? And I believe that uh, if we prayed for the downfall, the death or execution of a uh, North Korean, um, you know, person or the, you know, North Korean president or emperor, you know, or Chinese, you know, the China, you know, uh, people like that, that it would be within God's will. But that doesn't mean that we can't balance that with saying, hey, God, also, you know, you know, I pray that they will hearken to your heart or that, you know, someone, you know, will uh, experience, you know, that a missionary will get to them in a secret manner and be able to share the gospel with them. But if they don't, you know, hey, we're about the advancement of the kingdom of God. And so I think it's, you know, in our hearts, um, you know, God will, uh, I think, help us to, uh, with that conviction, um, of which way to go and which way to pray, you know, um, where all of our prayers should be divinely influenced um, you know, and everything like that with uh, the power of uh, and guidance um, of God, the Holy Spirit. And, and so that's my thoughts on that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I guess I would just, um, because sometimes we can pray against somebody or some, something, and, you know, and I'm not, I'm not necessarily talking about a Saddam Hussein or an Osama bin Laden, you yeah. know, but sometimes we can uh, push prayers out there without having, you know, a, a complete mindset of oh, yeah. who that person is, yeah. you know, um, we, we have a story or we have a side or we have this uh, facet that we know about them, but we don't necessarily know the other side of that, that yeah. maybe they, maybe they, you know, um, are believers, but they might just have some practices that we just don't agree with. And so yeah. we want to pray, you know, imprecatorily against them, you know, and that, that that's kind of my, my uh, apprehension to it, I guess. Yeah. And, and I mean, there are, there, are, we, we just, we're not, uh, we're not sovereign. We're not um, uh, um, omniscient. So we don't know what God is doing through certain people. I don't know how God is 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 planning on using you know President Trump and and what could be the last few months of this term and maybe a next term or or Joe Biden. Um, you know, both of them have uh, policies and stuff that uh, other people. I want to be careful. You know, uh, you know, yeah. are not in in favor of. But I I can say this. You know, in a positive way, I think President Trump has done some some great things. You know, and and giving money to HBCUs and in police reform. Um, and different things like that. I think it's it's impractical, erroneous, and quite you know disrespectful to act like his entire pregnant uh, presidency has been a negative thing. You know, can you can people find something that they want to criticize him? Well, of course people can try to do that and everything. But uh, there's this old movie. I don't know. It was a remake uh, of the movie Polly um, from an African American version, or Pollyanna, but from an African American version um, called Polly. But there was this line in there um, where the young lady says. You know, if you look for the bad in people, you'll always find it. And that, for me, is my biggest problem, man. I, I can't stand politics. Um, I, I really, it just, 
the whole system just irks me to my nerves because it's like Democrats will not see anything right with something that a Republican does. And Republicans cannot see any good in anything that the Democrats do. And so there's always this, they can never meet in the middle. I, you know, like if, if I could, I'll say this in a comical, but a kind of truthful way. The first mm -hmm. person I would vote for is the person that says, hey, that person has a good plan. And if I get elected, I'll execute the same plan that they do because it's the best thing for the American people. You know, like, mm -hmm. You can't tell me that in these long debates, like they can't agree on nothing. There's not one yeah. piece of policy that they can't agree on. And then the other thing, and we, we just talking now, man, it's like yeah. uh, the um, the spin rooms, like me and my wife will sit up sometimes and we'll watch the way that they spin these things. And it's like, stop insulting my intellectual honesty by you know acting like this person like you don't know that this person didn't give a good answer or that this person did give a good answer and so you have to spin it in a way that makes your party look good and it's like you know seeing like fox you can't say nothing good about biden cnn you yeah can't say nothing good about president trump it's like come on you 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 lose credibility with me as a voter um you know by doing stupid stuff like that and it's like come on just just be honest and there's nothing wrong with saying hey President Trump has done some great things, and, and I hope that if he is elected, that he continues to operate in these things, but I hope that if he's elected, he does better things. Or him saying, hey, I hope that you know uh, Biden does these things if he gets elected, because what we really want is what's best for the American people, not what's best for my party. And that's my biggest thing uh, you know, with that. So praying, I think we got to check our hearts if we're praying imprecatorily for the death of either one of those candidates. Like, yeah. Right. You know, I might need to pray for you, man, because you you you, you take <laughs> far. You know, if God can use Cyrus and Nebuchadnezzar and all that stuff without killing them, you know, and everything, surely God can use President Trump or you know Joe Biden um, and still fulfill His will. Um, you know, through the the heart of the King, the Bible says, is in God's hands, and He can steer it whichever way He wants to. So, you know, um, I, I just pray for God's providence and and His will to be done through either candidate and uh and 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 that we all vote in in particular so yeah. right 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 it's good stuff man it's good stuff um yeah. so we've got about four minutes left i i um i know we, only, we have about five viewers right now so if anybody wants to ask any questions now is the time to ask it you can ask in the chat section on whatever platform you're viewing on whether it be facebook youtube or even twitch go ahead and do that now um and so i don't again like i uh I'm really kind of going off the cuff here. Um, and I wanted to bring up what you were talking about, two things that you talked about when you were talking talking specifically about uh, Psalms of the oppressed. Um, because again, in my very short research I did really quick, mm -hmm. uh, I was I was looking at the Psalms of, of uh, the imprecatory Psalms as only judgment. Um, but I like that you brought up the fact that there's also Psalms, there, there are also the Psalms of the oppressed as well. But you did bring up that second Timothy verse and um, and one thing I wanted to say is that that one seems like, you know, it, it seems both he's not necessarily um, just from what you read. It's not necessarily him praying for judgment against him, but just that his actions against uh, Paul to be, um, you know, counted for whether they're good or bad. He kind of left it up yeah. into God's hands. He was just kind of yeah. like, you know. Um, and, and and, and before I, I want to say real quick, that, and that's what imprecatory psalms are, is praying that this is in God's hands. It's not saying, hey, God, go do what I want to do. It's saying, hey, God, go do what you said you would do. You know, mm -hmm. you're the one that said that you would curse those who curse, uh, you know, uh, you know, Abraham and his seed and different things. And so it's saying, hey, God, we're asking you to obey your word, you know, and if people curse us or speak evil against us, that you would judge them, that you would condemn them. And that's the great thing about the imprecatory Psalm is they're not asking for God to execute judgment through their hands. David wasn't saying, Hey God, I want, I want to execute your judgment. He was saying, God, you execute your judgment and putting it into the hands and the will of God, knowing that God, what is the scripture, I believe is in Deuteronomy, says the God of the earth will always judge or judge righteously. And so I think that's the wonderful thing is when our heart is pure, we can say, hey, God, you know, this isn't my battle. This is yours. If you execute judgment, I know it will be just, I know it will be right, and I know it will be done in the right timing. And so in, in context, that's what the imprecatory psalms are. They're giving it into the hands of God for him to execute judgment and justice um, in his own divine prerogative and according to his sovereignty. 
Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's all the that's all the, the questions I got, man. <laughs> yeah. I know we only got a minute and nobody really asked any questions. Um, you know, my wife, you know, kind of said this uh right here, you know, absolutely. Um, we need to be uh you know, think before we speak, kind of thing. Um, and that's something that you know we both kind of drill in our heads because that's one thing we can do is we can just say stuff and not really think about what we're saying. Um yeah. So uh, right before we leave, uh, I am going to ask you to stick around uh, once we kind of wrap up here and all like that. But if you want to go ahead and plug uh, your ministry again and uh, anything else you got going on, go ahead and plug that now. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, again, um, if you're interested in just checking out more, you can find me on uh, all Facebook. Uh, you know, really all I do is Facebook and YouTube. Uh, my YouTube channel is just Greater Works Discipleship uh, and everything. And uh, if you connect with me on Facebook, you'll catch all of my different pages and different things like that. And I'm, I'm just one of those guys. I'm not real big into uh, like, yeah, I want you to subscribe on YouTube and all that stuff. If you want to mm -hmm. follow me, then great. But I'm not in it for that. You know, like some people are moved by followers. And, and how many likes and stuff that you get. That stuff is nice. Um, but for me, what really what really gets me going is when people are saying, hey, man, I really uh, heard what you said. I was really moved by that, you know, and different things like that. So it, it's not, I'm not out seeking a bunch of subscribers and all the other good stuff. But if you want to go to my website, uh, I'm not out to make money. The military pays me very well. Um, but I found out that, you know, if people pay or invest and sow into something, they're more likely to use it. So I used to give away all my PowerPoints for free. And then I found out, you know, like nobody's using them. They're just storing up on their computer and stuff. But the people who are really interested in, you know, getting the truth out there, you know, and they five, ten, twenty dollars um, for something that took me three, four months to put together. Um, it's just sowing a seed into the ministry and it allows me the opportunity to continue putting out good work. So if you're looking, if you're interested, uh, www.greaterworksdiscipleship.com. Um, there's wonderful products on there. Again, uh, slavery in the Bible, hermeneutics and homiletics. Uh, we've done soteriology. Um, uh, we got Jesus versus uh, atheism on there. Um, so many different um, things. There's leadership trainings on there, um, PowerPoints and preaching messages and different things. Uh, uh, upcoming, um, I just finished a uh, uh, my one on Jesus and scientism. So I'll probably teach that on Facebook sometime this weekend and then uh, post that on there. Um, and different things. So uh, I, I just really want to get discipleship out there and people to learn and grow and become, uh, you know, my whole thing is three things, educate, equip, and empower disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. So fulfilling the great commandment and the great commission, uh, that's what your boy is all about. Um, and I love you. <laughs> so I'm really glad to make the connection with you. Uh, yeah, man. Checking out some more of your content and everything like that now that we've connected. And uh, you, you just never know who's watching. So I'm glad I wasn't on Facebook while and out. Or your wife is like, man, who is this dude on Facebook acting like a fool, you know? So <laughs> We actually are drawn to people like that. So. <laughs> All right, man. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the uh, the, the podcast. And uh, this will be uh, available on Apple Podcasts and Google, Google Podcasts as well. Um, but uh, if you stick around, I want to talk to you a little bit like after show kind of stuff. So, all right, stick around. All right, everybody. I want to thank you for tuning in tonight. I hope everybody enjoyed this conversation with Chaplain Kevin Benton Jr. Please go check out their uh, ministry, Greater Works Discipleship Ministry. You can find it on Facebook um, and also his website. And I'll put both of those links um, wherever you can find them. I'll put those in the description. Um, we you can we watch this wreath. Oh, oh, oh man, my words. We can you can rewatch this stream on my YouTube page. The link is in my bio, or you can listen on podcast uh, available on pod, Apple, Google Podcast and Apple Podcast. I hope to see you next time as we explore more Matt News. <laughs>